download our Revise It Right revision app for hundreds of videos, quizzes, exam questions, tutor support, and so much more. This video is about ionic compounds. Now, when we do a chemical reaction, we don't just use one or two atoms like we looked at when we were drawing our ionic bonding in a previous video. What we actually use is billions and billions of different atoms. Now, what that actually means is if we have billions of positively charged and negatively charged ions joining together, it forms a rather giant structure. And in terms of ionic bonding, it's called a giant ionic lattice and again a way we can imagine this is if i represent these ions that we drew in our previous video as circles of plus and minus and plus and minus and you can see that billions of them form together and they the electrostatic forces between them are in all directions they're above it they're below it they're to the right of them so you can see forming a rather giant structure which we call a giant ionic lattice, okay? So for example, if we take the uh, example of sodium chloride, for example, now we know that sodium forms a positive ion and chlorine forms a negative ion. Millions of these sodiums and chlorines will bind together to make a giant ionic lattice. Okay, remember, it is the electrostatic force between them that forms that ionic bond. That's important to note for the next bit. Now, I remember to download our Revise It Right Revision app, watch over 700 videos, answer 4,000 plus quiz questions, over 1,000 flashcards, 1,000 exam questions, worksheets, forums, and get help from qualified teachers and so much more. The link is in the description. Ionic compounds, all ionic compounds share the same properties. And there are two properties that we need to learn about that they share. And we also need to be able to explain why they have those properties. So property number one is that all ionic lattice compounds, so all giant ionic lattices have a high melting and boiling point. So all ionic lattice compounds have a high melting and boiling point. Now, why is this? Why do they have a high melting boiling point? Well, if we go back to this previous slide here, we were talking about how they're bonded together by these electrostatic forces. Okay, that, that bond them between the positively charged and negatively charged ions. Now we need to know, need to be aware that that electrostatic force is a very strong force. And because it's strong, it requires a lot of energy to break. So if we'd want to melt our solids and even then further if we want to turn these solids into uh, these liquids into a gas and we want to boil it we're going to need a lot of energy to break those bonds therefore it's going to need a high temperature because as we know as we increase the temperature we're increasing the energy we're providing so we need to provide a very high temperature to break these strong electrostatic forces between the ions and because of that they have a high melting and boiling point okay so if you ever were to ask a question of why does this ion compound for example why does sodium chloride have a high melting point the answer is always going to be the same but it's because the electrostatic forces between them are strong therefore it requires a lot of energy to break and therefore the structures or the, the sodium chloride in this example has a high melting point or a high boiling point. Okay, so property number one, they all have a high melting and boiling point. Now moving on then to property number two is that they only conduct electricity when molten or dissolved. Okay, so what this means really is they only conduct 
electricity when they are either melted, molten, they have turned into a liquid, or when they dissolve in water. Now, for you to get your head around this, what you really need to understand is how electricity is actually passed through a particular material. How does something conduct electricity? Well, let's draw our giant ionic lattice structure that we drew in the previous slide. Now, for electricity to be transferred between a material, you need two things. OK, now what you need is you need some sort of charged particles within that material. So materials that have no charge to them do not conduct electricity. And the second thing is you actually need these charged particles to be able to move. To carry the charge. So you need charged particles and you need the charged particles to be able to move. Now, if we go back to our drawing here of our solid ionic compound, does it have charged particles? Yes. Well, if we look, yes, it does. It has positive and negatively charged particles. So it can tick that. However, can these move? Well, when they're in their solid form, the particles, as we know from our solids, are in a fixed shape and they only vibrate among a fixed point. And if you don't know that, then please watch our video on the states of matter. So when they're in their solid form, they, these particles cannot move across the solid to transfer that electricity, to conduct that electricity. OK, so they, that's why they cannot conduct electricity when they are in their solid form. Yes, they have charged particles, but these charged particles cannot move to carry the charge. However, we, if we were to melt this solid, um, this giant ionic structure, if we were to melt it, the particles would look a bit more like this. OK, so this is when it's molten, this is when it's melted. Now, if we go back to our checklist, do they, does it have charged particles? Yes, it does. Are these now able to move? Well, yes, they can. We know that our particles within our liquids are more free to move. They're more, they're more freely able to move. And therefore, they can, can carry that charge and conduct electricity. OK, so when they're molten, when they're melted from the solid to liquid, ionic compounds can conduct electricity. But I also said that when they're dissolved in water, they can conduct electricity as well. So if we have our water molecules here, there's H2O, and then our ions dotted around, they're dissolved within that water. We go through that checklist again. So we put dissolved here. Are, is there charged particles here? Well, yes, there is. And are these able to move? Well, we can see now that these dissolved ions from the ionic compounds are much more free to move. And therefore, yes, they can conduct electricity. They can carry a charge and therefore can conduct electricity. So we need to be aware that when our ionic compounds are in their solid form, they cannot conduct electricity. However, when they are molten, melted, or dissolved in water, they can conduct electricity. And that is a property of all giant ionic compounds. So just to reiterate the two points there, you know, the first property is that they have high melting and boiling points. And the second property is that they can conduct electricity when molten or dissolved. So now what we'd like you to have a go at is answering these questions here to really check your understanding. So pause the video now. OK, let's go through these answers then. So number one, describe the structure and bonding in sodium fluoride. Give the formula of the ions involved. Well, there's an interesting question. It's starting to really pull in lots of different stuff from lots of different videos to really try and link that information together. So how could we come to terms of this question? Well, we know that sodium is in group one. OK. And we know that fluorine is in group seven. So sodium is therefore a metal and fluorine is therefore a non-metal. So we know that they're going to react and form an ionic bond. 
Okay, we know this because sodium can give up one electron and fluorine can receive and take that one electron. Okay, so fluorine can gain an electron, sodium can lose an electron. So we know there's going to be an ionic bond formed here. Now, we've just learned that when things ionically bond, they form an, a large ionic structure. OK, so we're going to get the sodium plus and the, the fluorine negative, and they're going to form a rather large ionic structure. OK, just like we looked at there. OK, so describe the structure and the bonding in sodium fluoride. Well, to answer the structure bit, we can say that they bond to form a large ionic or giant rather than large a giant ionic lattice that sort of describes the structure so they bond to form a giant ionic lattice where all the ions are bonded together by an electrostatic force a strong electrostatic force okay and bonding in so then the question also goes give the formula of the ions involved so we know that because sodium gives one electron and fluorine receives one electron, then then we can these can react in the ratio of one to one, okay? Because one is going to sodium is going to lose an electron, fluorine is going to gain that electron. So we know then that our formula would be Na because there's only one sodium needed, F because there's only one fluorine needed, and that really does answer the question. So we've, we've talked there about the structure that they form, giant ionic lattice, and how they bond with the electrostatic force, and how because sodium is in group 1, it's going to lose an electron, and how fluorine is in group 7, it's going to gain one electron, that therefore it becomes the formula NaF. So why does NaCl have a high melting point? Now really, the, a trick to answer on these questions as I sort of alluded to when I was talking about it, is anything really has a high melting point because it has strong bonds within it. Now, NaCl, we know that sodium is in group 1 and chlorine is in group 7. Therefore, they're going to form by an ionic bond. Okay, now we know that an ionic bond forms because there's an electrostatic force. And we know that this the electrostatic force is hard to break i.e. it requires a lot of energy to break and therefore it requires a lot of heat energy to break and therefore that's why NaCl has a high melting point okay so sodium chloride has a high melting point because the ionic bonds held together by the electrostatic forces require a lot of energy to break therefore sodium chloride has a high melting point in terms of electrons, how was the NaCl formed? Well, again, a, a little bit of a throwback, but we should really be able to start applying this information now. Na, we know, is in group 1. So sodium loses one electron. We can just say sodium loses one electron. And then chlorine gains the one electron. Okay, and then they bond due to the opposite attraction, which is an electrostatic force. So that really does summarize very nicely that question. And finally, potassium fluoride does not conduct electricity unless it's molten. Explain why. Well, potassium fluoride is an ionic compound. In these ionic compounds, yes, there is a charge, so they do contain charged particles, however, these charged particles do cannot freely move through the compound and therefore it cannot carry the electricity and not carry the charge and therefore it does not conduct electricity. And that would be a good answer. Okay, so potassium fluoride is an ionic compound. Ionic compounds do have charge or do contain charged particles, but these charged particles are not free to move, therefore they cannot carry the charge and not conduct electricity. So we've now looked at ionic compounds and how they form giant ionic lattices and then the properties of our giant ionic lattices and what you should hopefully see in these questions here is that the same answers can be applied to whatever really 
structure we're looking at, whether we're looking at sodium fluoride, whether we're looking at sodium chloride, whether we're looking at potassium fluoride, the answers are all the same. Okay, we can apply the, these answers to any particular ionic compound and they are the same answers. So now you can really move on to test yourself with the quiz and the exam questions of course and if there's anything you don't understand then please do get into contact with one of our tutors who will be happy to help.